Welcome back to this Shout Learning online conference. We're on conference number five, which is all about valuing the land in different ways different people can and are doing that. For those of you who are with us in the prior session, we hope you have a great sense as to how you might um, help tell the stories about people and their relationships to the land and share that back with all of us as part of a uh, of a, a citizen storytelling project. So we're looking forward to everyone's involvement in that from across the world. Uh, Joshua Bell is back with us. He's got one of the coolest titles I've ever seen. He's the curator <laughs> of globalization. Can you imagine trying to curate globalization? Uh, he does it. He's with the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. We'll talk more about what that might mean in just a moment. Um, but we're glad you're back with us. We've got our closed captions running here on the screen, and we want to uh, thank our friends at WGBH for keeping up with our fast-paced dialogue today. Um, we also have joining us from Kent in the UK, uh, our friend Dan Porter, who is illustrating the session. You've been enjoying seeing his illustrations and his handiwork uh, throughout today's events. Um, one quick thank you to all of our partners, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, as well as Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global uh, for their collaboration in bringing you shoutlearning.org. So do check out the website. If you remember one link, uh, you can find your way to all of the various resource resources that's at shoutlearning.org. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor back to Josh to uh, lead us on a, a great exploration and to tag along on some of the wonderful work that he's been doing. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome into the session if you're just joining us or if you, you stayed with us. Um, I, I thought I'd start. Um, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and, as um, Jonathan mentioned, curator of globalization. Um, and we'll get into that, what that means. But I wanted to ask quickly um, what people, if anything, they know about Papua New Guinea. And I'll just throw that out to you all. If you've heard of the country, if you know anything about the country, so what, and yeah. Yeah. we could do a little collection of uh, tidbits, facts, thoughts, impressions. What do you know? Um, and we've put that question in the chat area. And I, I, I gave you all a major hint by putting uh, an image that you see um, of the country or of the island of New Guinea, actually, uh, which we'll get into above Australia. And maybe people are warming up. So I'll, I'll just jump in. I mean, so one of the things that is interesting about the island of New Guinea, um, and the reason why myself and other anthropologists, biologists, et cetera, work there is that um, New Guinea is, well, it's the world's uh, second largest island in the world. Um, and it's divided currently into two um, countries. So the um, eastern half, um, the right half on the screen here, is um, the independent nation of Papua New Guinea. Um, and the left side, or the west side, is um, owned by Indonesia. And that's the, the provinces of Papua and West Papua. But um, New Guinea is actually, the island of New Guinea is remarkable for a lot of reasons. It is one of the world's most culturally and biologically diverse places in the planet. Um, there are over 1,000 languages spoken on the island of New Guinea. Within Papua New Guinea itself, there are over 850 different languages spoken, which is a pretty good index of the different kind of cultural groups. Um, but perhaps within the context of this um, discussion, also remarkable is that it has the largest extent rainforest in the Pacific. Um, and this is a forest that goes from both sides of the country. Um, yep, and as Michelle Smith noted, it is also uniquely known for um, its various birds of paradise, which are unique bird species. So there's a huge, actually, realm of um, indigenous animals that are endemic only to the island of New Guinea, marsupial species, um, strange mammals, the long, um, what is it, the long-nosed beaked echidna, and various tree kangaroos, etc. cetera. Um, but I wanted to give people just a sense of kind of the intense uh, time history of New Guinea, uh, which is that really, you know, I've put up some cat facts here, and, and it's that, you know, 50,000 years ago, humans first move into the island, um, and they come from Asia and through Indonesia um, during what was then the Ice Age um, when uh, the island of New Guinea was connected to Australia. And they begin to settle 
Uh, then 9,000 years ago, we find that actually agriculture was independently developed in the New Guinea highlands. Uh, one of the remarkable facts about um, the island of New Guinea is this is where sugarcane, which was, was domesticated originally, and then flowed out to the rest of the world, um, which most people don't realize. Um, and then kind of then Polynesians or the kind of ancestors of the Polynesian, the Austronesian speakers, arrived 25,000 years ago, and they bring with them a whole set of um, fishing and um, canoe techniques coming from Taiwan out into the island, intermarrying with already extant groups, and then moving out into the Pacific um, to settle places such as Hawaii, Madagascar, and other places. So I mention all these things because most people, when they think of Papua New Guinea that I've run into, think of Papua New Guinea as kind of being this far-off, remote country um, where people still live in the so-called Stone Age, um, doing you know, and having no concept of the outside world, which actually couldn't be further from the truth. Um, New Guinea's kind of been at a kind of whole host of intersections for a very, very long time with the world and the, the kind of world's population through a variety of things. Um, the other kind of facts that I've put out which are important for what I'm going to be talking about are the kind of list of histories in terms of the colonial histories. Um, so very early on in 1828, um, the Dutch claim the west portion of the island of New Guinea, and they do this because of the natural resources that are found there. Um, and, you know, again, as I mentioned, this is an area where there are various bird species, um, trees, and other things that uh, Europeans were very interested in. Um, the What is now Papua New Guinea then gets divided up between the Germans and the British very quickly. Um, and then by after World War I, um, the British and really the Australians are administering the, the colony. Um, and then 1961, Indonesians uh, take over West Papua. Um, a little known fact is that there's a kind of ongoing issues around independence there. Uh, which we can touch on later. Maybe people have heard about that. But then also then in 1975, Papua New Guinea becomes an independent nation. Um, so it is currently part of the um, British Commonwealth. So they recognize the queen um, and they have a parliamentary democracy. Uh, but like a lot of countries um, that are very resource rich and Papua New Guinea, because it's along the, or really the island of New Guinea, because it's along the ring of fire that goes around the Pacific, has amazing sets of resources. So I mentioned the forest, but it also has the world's largest gold mine is in West Papua, um, and there are extensive copper and gold mines throughout Papua New Guinea, as well as oil and gas. So when, what my research is focusing on a lot is the kind of impacts of these uh, logging and other activities that, that go on. Um, so I just wanted to give people a better sense of the country, and I'm showing you here a kind of another Google Earth snapshot. Um, where I worked, and if you were with me in the last session, you would have seen this, um, an image of this, but I work up here in the Parari Delta with a community of about 12,000 people who speak um, three languages. The main language is a local language known as Parari. They speak Tok Pisin, which is a uh, Pidgin English, a uh, Creole language, um, and then they speak Motu, and then some local other local dialects. Um, this area is largely remote, and this is one of the major kind of things about the island of New Guinea and Papua New Guinea is that predominant amount, it's something like 90% of the population lives in rural setting. Um, the main capital of the city is here in Port Moresby, um, and this is where most people go for migration for jobs. So there's a huge issue in the country right now in terms of migration to urban centers such as Port Moresby and some others. I should say also that there are about um, 6 million people in, the, uh, in Papua New Guinea, which has about the land mass of the island of California to give people kind of scale, those of us in North America. Uh, so again, remarkable amount of people in a particular locality um, in a diverse environment. What you're seeing here is this ridge line, which is the central quarter line mountains that go through New Guinea. And then on the coast where I work is lowland rainforest, um, which has particular dynamics. Now, at least people think that the island is just um, rural. Um, I wanted to show people images of what urban 
New Guinea looks like, uh, or Papua New Guinea. And this is uh, the village of Hanawabata, which is um, inhabited by the Motuan people, who were the original uh, community that was around Port Moresby. You can see downtown Port Moresby here in the background with high rises. Um, but this village is interesting because they've retained their traditional buildings that is over water but with new kind of um, materials to make that with. And they have jobs and office buildings as well as doing traditional fishing, etc. Um, so Papua New Guinea is this interesting um, quixotic blend of, what, uh, of traditions as well as what we might see as modern um, activities. Here's a shot of downtown Moresby. So... The, the biggest issue with Papua New Guinea that I've encountered over the 11 years of working there is that uh, Papua New Guineans, the country over, know about the outside world. So they see video discs of the latest movies, in fact, sometimes before we do because of pirate, pirating of DVDs. Um, so they have a, access to the kind of media streams that we do, right? So when I went to originally work in 2000, they knew who Britney Spears was. And they, we listen to ABBA in the village and that sort of thing. The biggest issue for communities is accessing those things, right? So they, they find out the way we live and living standards that we have. And then the issue is how do we uh, gain access to that? And the problem, at least for the Prairie Delta and other communities in the Gulf Province, is that by and large, um, Today, there aren't many access to revenue streams, and partly that is due to kind of the bust and booms of the country's economics, um, as well as the kind of environment they lived in. Um, and if we go to that, one of the remarkable things about the Delta is um, that people do not have, um, for example, there are no roads, right? So it is an area dominated by um, intertidal swamp, so lots and lots of rivers. Uh, one does not walk between villages. There are about 22 villages in the area. One always travels by canoes. So that kind of creates a very particular um, sense of the landscape. Um, and it was something, you know, coming from urban Philadelphia and the suburbs, um, getting used to that was remarkable. Um, here's another shot of people actually moving through by canoe um, and what that environment is like. And here's a shot of the village of Mapayo, which was about a community of about 600 people that I work closely with. And this is a shot um, from airplane actually flying into the um, by Muru, the, the government station where uh, the police station where the general store was. Um, and I was very fortunate that we flew over the village. Um, and what you can see here is villages in the Delta uh, because of the nature of the environment, um, are all built on the ridges of um, of the rivers. And they are largely, as I mentioned, subsistence-based um, horticulturalists, that is, farmers, as well as hunters and fishers. Um, and we'll just show you. So here are some images of the village. Um, People live in houses that are made out of um, forest materials. Um, so the thatching on the house here is all made from nipa palms, which grows down on the coast, which is about four miles away by canoe. Um, the walling is all made from various bamboo and other woods, um, and the house post is made out of hardwood. Um, so again, this is a house that lasts probably about five years. Um, so it gives you a sense of kind of how intimately people are connected to their landscapes and how they have to rely on natural resources. People do have access to pots and pans, but in many cases, these are things that people have had for a very long time. Um, just wanted to give you a sense of what people eat. And I don't know if this resonates with people who you know are joining us from around the world, but um, Obviously, uh, fish is a huge part of their diet, so we have um, such things as prawns, um, garden materials, or garden produce, that is. Um, Jerry, a friend of mine, is actually making garden here of maniota, or um, uh, what is it called? I've forgotten. Maniota, uh, so it's cassava. Um, and then also making sago um uh, which I will get into later in the talk, which is really the interior pith of a palm tree. Um, as I mentioned, the forest is very, very important to people. 
Um, and this has actually brought them into a huge – this is why logging companies are interested in the region and the kind of tensions that have emerged. And this is what I really want to um, – talk about. Yes, and as Jonathan pointed out, if people have questions, please do jump in. Um, the trees, uh, they have various hardwood trees in the region as well as rattan that is used for a variety of things. Locally, that's traditionally used for um, canoes and housing. Um, but I've been speaking for a while. I don't know, do people have a sense of what anthropology is out there? Let's go ahead and find out what, what people... Uh associate with anthropology? What does it mean to you when we say, what is anthropology? Go ahead and give us a, the quick definition, the quick thought that comes to mind. And uh, we'll let people go ahead and put that in the chat box. What is anthropology? Uh, Selena's very fast. Nice to see you, Selena. Thank you. Yeah. Right, the studies of cultures past and present. That's a good definition. Yeah. Presentation of cultures, yeah. I mean, anthropology um, is very much, it's the understanding, um, I mean, does, do people out there know what culture is, right? I mean, that would be a question. But I would say that anthropology, everyone, everything that's people saying, it's what people do, right? So how people, what they do in their daily lives, what they think about, and how they live. Um, so anthropology is one of these disciplines that is really about everything. Um, so you can look at, you know, urban youth movements, hip hop, to you know what I do in terms of working with communities in um, the rainforest of, of lowland Papua New Guinea. Does anyone out there have a sense of how we anthropologists study societies and cultures? Which is David commented, what anthropologists do. Does anyone have any quick comment? So this is, um, how do you do what you do? Is, that, is mm. that what we're asking? Yeah, how do you do it? Yeah, so how does, how, what are some of the techniques or strategies that an anthropologist employs to do their work? Um, uh, oh, that's, an, I'm sorry, Amy, I, oh, I, yeah. yeah, live there, yeah. she said. Good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I, so I, I should have mentioned, I've, I've been working there for 11 years. Um, when I was there, the bulk of my time, I lived there for two years, from 2001 to 2002, um, and learned the language. Um, I see that Maria in Santo Domingo and fearing how people use artifacts. Actually, what we do is also we study how people make things, and I'm going to be getting to that later in the presentation. Um, we do do statistical analysis um, and a variety of things. I'm showing some images here now of, um, I put up, what uh, one way of talking about is participant observation, which gets at what Selena from Wasilla, Alaska is commenting about, and immersing yourself within a particular culture, right? So it's learning skill sets um, that people have. So, you know, I, uh, when hunting for the first time in my life, not that I was very good at it, I learned how to paddle and to make help to make a canoe. Um, I must admit that in this particular picture in the bottom right, I think I lasted maybe um, 10 to 20 minutes in the heat. Uh, this is a country or area of the country where, you know, it's uh, like Washington, D.C. is in the middle of August. So you're looking at 100 degrees uh, well, 90 to 100 degrees with 100% uh, humidity, so very, very uh, humid and hot weather. Um, so essentially, you learn how people do what they do. And I think, again, anthropology is one of these adventures where you end up doing things that you never thought you could do. Um, but one of the other things we do is to talk to people um, and I couldn't be talking to you all today um, about what I've done if it weren't for some of the men that I'm showing you here. Unfortunately, all of which have died, passed away um, within the last few years. But these men, and we talked about oral histories in the last um, segment, um, a lot of my work is about collecting oral histories and talking to people about what they've, their life experiences over the last 30 to 40 years um, and how they, in light of those life experiences, how they understand the current impacts. Um, so one of the things that anthropology does is kind of opens you up to different worlds, as I mentioned in the last session, 
and it kind of opens you up to these people's um, lives and in, and in, in the process makes you part of their lives, right? So um, as you take anthropology seriously, um, you become as much as one can a part of the community and then part of your lives. So it's a, a deeply um, transformative experience for all involved. Now, for those of you who um, were here in the last session, I apologize for, for um, showing this slide again, but I wanted to give those of you who are new image of the region and um, where I worked. I, I showed you this before, this map before, but here's Mapaya, which I showed you that image of earlier. This is by Maru, where um, uh, people go in by plane. I didn't put it on the map, but um, there's... Um, an image here of Kapuna, Kapuna, which is the hospital, regional hospital. That is uh, between Mapayo and Kapuna is about a half day if you're paddling by a canoe. If it's from Mapayo to Baimuru, that's one day to get to Baimuru. Um, these two centers, Kapuna and Baimuru, are where most economic activity is, and one can actually sell fish various um, and actually sell um, timber to local sawmills. And we talked about it before, but up here um, and here are the logging roads. Um, this is the, the work of Rabina Hinjau, a Malaysian um, conglomerate that is working all over the world. Um, and they've gotten licenses through the um, Papua New Guinea government with and without consent of local communities, and this is actually a huge source of tension among communities. Um, and they're logging the hardwood forests that are in this forest block. What has happened since I um, have been working there is a Canadian company by the name of InterOil is working and now um, extracting oil and gas up in this region. And there's also talk of a potential dam, a large hydro project going into this area up here. Um, and this, as you can imagine, has put the community in various positions of being very happy and very um, concerned. And, and I just wanted to throw it out to the community, or community who's engaging in this conversation. What do people think the impacts of resource extraction, that is uh, forest, um, you know, forestry, oil and gas um, extraction are? Does anyone have any ideas out there? So you mentioned that some are are happy and some are concerned. So we can be looking to impacts on yep. on, on that full range, um, right? And we're already seeing Maria and uh, right. uh, Dana jumping in. Uh, devastation, pollution. Yep. An instant change of the landscape, says uh, Sherry in Florida. Mm. Definitely, all of these things are right. Loss of habitat. Increased standard of living, change of what's well, interesting actually, and I'll get into this, but the the increase in standard of living comes at various costs, which is interesting. Um, uh, and these are rolling in, which is great. Well, as you can imagine, um, one of the things that happens um, is, and I'll show you slides of this. Um, sites, this is one of the, this was a logging site here um, and a logging camp here. Um, these become new kind of economic zones for people to go. So one thing that happens is actually people move from Mapayo and build hunting and fishing camps around the sites um, to actually get access to the kind of um, money that's circulating to uh, workers. So it is a source of employment for some, uh, but, you know, it, it, it comes at a cost. One of the things that has, um, and I've written about this, that's, that's happening is, you know, these logging ships such as this one come in from all over the world, and they enter in informal exchanges with people. So they exchange such things as alcohol um, uh, for birds that are local and that should not be exported um, and HIV AIDS has been introduced through um, prostitution that has emerged and a whole set of social issues. So um, let's just turn to some of those. I mean, people mentioned the environment impact. This is a shot of Kalmea, one of the logging camps. Um, and it gives you a sense of this is not what most of the logging is done. Actually, logging roads go in and it's kind of, in quote, selective um, in that they then 
cut, harvest the logs from along the roads. But what that does is to create um, certain areas, particularly at the camps, where there's no fol foliage and tree coverage, such that when heavy rains come, such as in this image, increased soil goes into the water. Um, and this then adds to what we call the turbidity or the amount of dirt in the water, which has various impacts. Um, as we kind of talked about in the last section, this for, for the community, um, life uh, revolves around the river, right? It is their source of water, it's their source of food. So in March 2010, when I was back, um, people were showing me fish such as this fish, um, a Michael fish, um, which was riddled with sores, and you can see one there, um, and there are various ones all along here. And what that is, is the fish is actually being impacted upon by that increased uh, dirt sedimentation in the water, which is stripping away the kind of coating uh, that protects the fish, um, and then leads to greater skin infection. So along with that, you can imagine come various uh, oil, gas, and other chemicals that people were using. Um, so, you know, workers related to me and well as community members that men go in, they treat the logs with various um, uh, various chemicals to prevent wood boring insects from going into them as they're waiting to be uh, put on the dock. And it comes to pass that the men who don't get paid enough actually were going into the creeks and spraying this chemical into the creeks to get to kill the fish that were there. Um, so you have a variety of kind of impacts. One of the things is the waste. I mentioned this, but the waste from the logging camps itself. Um, so this is trash that is accumulated in this waste bin here. Um, but according to the workers who were there, um, the and I watched this happen, although I couldn't go to exactly where it was happening, it is taken and dumped in the forest. So right, so then you have all this plastic rubbish gets dumped. Hey, um, and I see some... Uh, just a, a, a quick question uh, mm. for you. you. You talked about, you know, you could only get in so far and you witnessed this right. firsthand. As you're showing us some of these pictures, I'm kind of curious, are you being guided? Um, are you finding out about these places and these things through the stories that you're hearing from people as you sit down right. to take their histories? Or yeah. are you kind of like the outsider who's just trying to figure it out? No. Your own? Yeah, no. So I went to all of these logging camps um, and talk to people extensively about their experiences. Um, in this particular um, case, uh, I visited this camp as part of a larger survey of the region after, after I, I did the sur initial survey in 2002, and then I did it eight years later to find out um, what was going on. So I went and visited the camps, went and visited villages nearby to interview them about um, what they saw as the social and environmental impact. Um, so I was with, a, you know, a group of men from Mapayo who had contacts, et cetera, with, with people in all of the sites that we went. Um, yeah, I, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and I see Melissa has asked, did I run into resistance from the company folks? That's a very good question. Um, in the oil and gas, I was able to go to the landing site, but I was not given permission to go into the into the site, and um, and they cited issues of safety, um, and they told me, and I didn't have the time to check, that if I had cleared it with company officials, I may have been able to go on. Um, in terms of the logging camp, um, I was able to go around because I needed to buy fuel, so I walked around and um, went there um, and did that. So I'm getting a question here from David, what is the government doing about it? Um, that's a very thorny question. Um, like a lot of countries, um, government officials are very close to logging companies. Um, so there's a lot of interaction that goes around, particularly um, during um, election time. So people um, get you know, campaign, campaign contributions, and they become kind of sponsored by the logging companies. So there is local um, kind of upset and response, but again, as you're saying, yeah, corruption as usual. Um, yeah, and there's a big disconnect to be, you know, to go on to that a little further between the people who live where the logging is happening and those people who live 
in the actual um, urban settings where they have access to these companies. So there's a big kind of disconnect going on there. I did see one of the comments was about species um, migrate, adapt, or die, and that is true. I didn't put um, images of this up, but one of the things that's happening a lot is that um, communities um, are actually hunting, increasing hunting, right? So it's not only that communities now have access, um, but they um, are killing more cassowaries, for example, a large bird, or, you know, so there is a huge impact. Maybe if we can go back to the slides, I'll show you all something because this is an interesting comment or an interesting perspective. Oh, here, oh, Before I do that, I have one image here to show you, which is about the work conditions. Um, so one of the things, this is not only um, kind of creates cycles of dependency and problems for communities, but it also um, creates problems for the workers. So the workers are given um, equipment such as the safety boot, which cr uh, crack and break. Um, so it's unsafe working um, conditions, unsanitary, you know, living standards. So, for example, at this logging camp, there were no toilets. So things such as um, ring, um, what is it, hookworm, and various other diseases were pretty prevalent. Um, and that sort of thing, for example, I wasn't able to get access to, but informally talking to people, I was able to. Um, get access to, to those dialogues. Now here though, at least we think that you know these areas stay deforested forever. This was a logging camp um, company, camp in 2002 um, that I visited and this is what it looks like now. So this image of the forest regrowth is a bit deceptive because when you begin to you know look at actually the type of forest that comes back and this is where I have to work with um, biologists to do more work on this um, is um, it's all waste trees, what local people refer to as rubbish trees. So these are trees that are known for their sting nettle-like leaves, and they are not useful for anything. Um, so it takes the forest a very long time to regenerate. So it is very, very destructive on various levels, but we don't know how destructive, and we don't know, at least in Papua New Guinea, how quickly, if at all, these forests bounce back. Now I see that Melissa is asking, do you see any um, any fit to local sides, uh, to local people having job creation? Um, yeah, so there are local um, jobs that are created for people, but what happens is that um, local people are hired um, as kind of very base level. So they're 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 uh, hired as chain crews and various things, so helping with chainsaws, and then they can slowly work their way up, but it takes an awfully long time, because the way the company works is they bring uh, chainsaw operators, bulldozer operators from other areas of Papua New Guinea that have had long logging for a while. Um, so local people come in at the very bottom level, and then if they can, they work their way up. Um, but they're not paid enough, um, and so they try to subsist by having families supply them with food. Um, and they get into debt uh, with the company often. And I see that Barbara says that no tree is, not, is useful for anything. Well, what happens is that the, the kind of, it's kind of, the environment's diminished after the logging. So what's useful for people is the large hardwood trees, um, various fruit-bearing trees, nut-bearing trees, and these are all gone after the logging. Um, so it takes a very long time, you know, at least more than 10 years before this forest is going to be useful. Interestingly, though, animals do come back. Um, so hunting can be done again. But, you know, again, I haven't done the research to know what sort of impact, long-lasting environmental impact. Hey, Josh, um, a quick question. I'm wondering if, as, as, we, we're, as we look at these pictures and, and see... Mm. Um, and see New Guinea through through your eyes and through these photographs. I'm wondering, going back to the exercise that you did earlier yep. to us, where we looked at a photo from a hundred years ago and wondered what right. somebody, if you if somebody, if you were to show a picture like the one the one we're looking at or the ones we've looked mm. been looking at to someone uh, who lives there right now, mm. what kind of story would they tell you about that photo? Right. Well, if I go back to this site, so Kalmea. Um, 
in 2010, this is actually a very interesting site because this is actually um, an ancestral site that figures into a story where two um, sisters, uh, the story goes that they had the moon in their house and a dog, a very naughty dog, came and stole the moon, which was a small um, kind of, it was almost like a shell, a very shiny shell. And he stole the moon and ran off and up into the sky with the moon. And the daughters, or the sisters, rather, follow him to try to get it back. And one of the sites they stop um, and do various things is this where this logging camp was. Um, so when I went through in March 2010, um, one of the elders I work with, Navara, um, whose clan histories, ancestral histories, tie to the site, was very, very upset because he had never seen it. Um, but he started singing a song um, uh, that he had composed about the kind of bleeding hills and various things. So it prompts people in various ways um, and various deep things. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a very emotional thing because people are kind of, as I mentioned, caught betwixt and between, right? So how do they gain access to the things we have um, and how do they, you know, uh, live? Um, you know, urban, I've spoken to urban people from the Prairie Delta, and they say, look, you know, uh, the trees are our way to become developed, and no one's going to get in our way from doing that. Um, and some people in villages feel that way, but, you know, when you are suffering from gastrointestinal issues because you can't drink the water, um, people think long and hard about, you know, what is happening and why they aren't, for example, getting royalty, money, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, um, I mean, one of the things I see here, this comment um, coming back from Maria from Santa Domingo, who's been to Papua New Guinea, and it, she's commenting about how um, the warmest weather that she's experienced um, and whether deforest practices has climate change. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm not a climate scientist or, uh, or an ecologist, but certainly people talk about how um, the weather is changing. So the 19... Was it 1998 or 99? The El Nino that came through had very, very intensive impact on um, this area of Papua New Guinea, in fact, the whole country. And people talk about the environment not being the same after that. Um, so they do talk about how things are changing. Um, but And they mentioned this most recent trip that the rainy season has changed. So the rainy season is happening persistently, um, or, you know, or dry seasons are happening at different so there is a kind of temperature effect. Um, the other thing that's going on is that men showed me, at least in my survey, various uh, stone artifacts that kind of indicate that cultural sites are being destroyed. And this is another thing that happens with clear-cut um, you know, logging or this kind of road creation is that we lose access to the past and to various archaeological sites, sites that we do when we don't know about. Um, and these are, you know, very profoundly moving. And this is where, you know, companies do and don't do the social impact analysis that they're supposed to do. Um, the other thing that, that happens, and I kind of, we kind of touched upon this, is um, what I call a kind of um, fortress capitalism. So it kind of creates this new dependencies and cycles of violence that happen. So these are um, images of Chinese-run store. These are new merchants that have come in kind of in the wake of the logging. Um, and this is a kind of uh, typical model where, um, ex you know, foreign merchants come in and um, build up local resentment because they're taking away from local businesses. And this uh, store owner in particular was when he was opening his store um, within the first month was robbed at gunpoint by local people and then kind of built this fortress kind of live in and now has a gun and is afraid of, of things. And so it creates mutual distrust and kind of problems and erodes the social ties that people have. Yeah, and I see David here is commenting about how the rivers are drying out. Yeah, that I don't think is going to happen in the immediate future for um, the Delta, but one does find actually how, um, how, um, the kind of sedimentation is happening. So, yeah, the, the, the kind of rivers are bottoming out. Um, Heather's commenting that poverty is not always to blame for deforestation. 
No, it isn't. And uh, that is a good point, Heather. I mean, I think it's, though, a combination of things, right? So um, at least in Papua New Guinea, um, forestry is one way to make money. Um, So it's a very important way uh, for people um, to earn cash. And then I would say that poverty, though, is one of the driving factors of deforestation. So it is very important. Um, so if if people in the Ferrari could find other means of making a living um, that or alternatives like small scale logging, sustainable logging practices, then I don't think we'd be seeing the same impacts. Um, so that's just a point to make. Um, going on, and this goes into the social impacts where I work. Um, um, the the communities that are getting money, income gets redistributed through gambling. That happens quite often. Um, and in this village situation, it was actually quite um, really um, upsetting in that, you know, people just turn to gambling and will gamble 24 hours, right? So that is my own subjective view. But, you know, people were neglecting their children or as a result. And so it creates a really uh, different social dynamics. Um, yeah, I do agree with uh, Sarah, your comment about other employment opportunities to be addressed in social policies. That That is very true. Um, and, you know, part of it is the extent to which the government can um, to work on this um, and kind of enact these things. Now, I see a different comment coming in from Heather. Um, okay, let me just read it. Yeah. Well, I don't want to blame the first world entirely, but I do think that, um, you know, uh, there's a combination of things, and it's actually probably outside of the boundaries. We all probably end up talking too much about this. But there are cycles of dependency that are created, and this is where first world economies, um, if I can paint a broad brush, um, you know, driven by capitalism, driven by consumption, um, really need to think about things, right? So this is where one's own, con- you know, consumption of things, thinking about where wood is coming from that you buy. Um, you know, IKEA, for example, um, touts its ethically sourced timber, um, and you know, making your own consumption choices, which do have impacts on faraway places like Papua New Guinea and Africa and other areas, uh, or buying fair trade. Not that fair trade is always good. Um, but, you know, thinking about consumption because we all are interconnected. And this is where, you know, the people that I work with are deeply affected by both government policies um, and these companies. And it is, as Sarah Hassan pointed out, a combination of internal external factors. Um, you know, major thing is education, right? So if people do not are not educated in terms like the communities that we talked about um, in Medang, um, that the Smithsonian is working with the Forest Network to set up a, a conservation site. If they don't know that that's an option, that then that becomes a problem. Um, or, for example, upriver from where I work, there used to be Crater Mountain Conservation Area. That collapsed in due to a large part because of the pressures um, of oil and gas and gold mining industry um, being interested in it, and various politicians and community members wanting a quick access to um, money. So part of it is actually understanding what the long-term implications of things are. Um, because not everyone can live in the city. Um, and then if you don't have easy access to sustainable income, how are you going to survive if you don't have your environment? Josh, I, actually, this is a good uh, – this mm-hmm. photo coming up on the screen shows yeah. you working with uh, with a, an intergenerational uh, group. Yep. And I, I can't help but wonder I, – I can hear it in your voice as you, mm. you talk about this in a in a very you know, rational, reasonable way, but I can't imagine right. – not being deeply affected both personally and and professionally oh, by the thing. kinds of stories and the relationships you've built, and I'm wondering right. if you have a you can give us a sense as to how you personally have been affected by your time there. Well, um, you know, I you know about deforestation, you know about the impacts of logging, but you don't know about it until you're living with a community that is faced with it, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that I haven't really addressed is deep uh, where in this communities that I work with in Papua New Guinea have very um, prevalent beliefs in sorcery. Um, and so that is really just an expression of jealousies. And um, so no one dies in this region without it being blamed 
on someone else um, as a kind of factor. And usually what happens is jealousies arise out of in unequal economic, uh, you know, who has money and who doesn't. And so what has happened in, you know, people have always been jealous of one another, and this is one of the enduring issues in a small-scale community and the large-scale community such as our own here in the U.S. Um, but, you know, when you're living cheek-to-jowl with people, um, you know, what happens when logging comes in is that it exacerbates these jealousies, it exacerbates distrust, it ex- it breaks down social ties such that, you know, um, you know, where I work, um, the, the government came in and said, okay, if you want access to this logging, you have to argue who is a tradition, you have to tell us who is a traditional landowner and who isn't. And so that worked to basically make the community say, right, so we have to identify our clans. Well, anyone who um, knows Papua New Guinea or elsewhere in the world, kinship, that is, who your mother, father, brother, sister is, can be very fluid, right? So in this area, people... Um, reckon descent through their fathers, but adoption is very big. So suddenly the government came in asking for identification of who belonged to clan X, Y, and Z, and the community had to say, you know what, guess what? We want our clan only to have 30 people so that we all get more money from the government or the company when the money's paid out. You know, Joe, you've been, you know, three generations you've been in our community um, and you were adopted in, but guess what? You've got to go back to your old clan. Um, to where your great-grandfather came from. So sudden rifts emerge, um, you know, and all sorts of social problems. So I found it, you know, profoundly upsetting. Um, When I first arrived in, for long-term 2001, the mobile police were present in the area, and they were searching for homemade guns, for marijuana, which was prevalent in the area. And there were all these rumors that they were going to come to the village I was in and beat people up. And people started talking about how well if the police came that they would fight. And so very on, within a month of being there, I was thinking, oh, my God, what have I done? Um, and none of that came to pass, thank God. But there's a kind of heightened social pressures, tension. Um, that is very upsetting. Now, one of the things that I've done to try to work with people is to kind of empower them by collecting these oral histories, which then I gave back to people. And that was profoundly, you know, moving, I think, for them, because as a stranger, you know, I came in and was there for two years, and I said, well, I'm recording histories for you, and I made all of these histories, I recorded it, but then I came back in 2006, and I gave those to the various men and clans that shared their stories with them so that they can use them. And people were very moved, and a lot of the people who had actually been silent and didn't want to talk to me actually now wanted to talk to me, and then asking them what to do, because as I've gone back, the impacts of the logging and the oil and gas are just getting more and more prevalent, um, is to then um, work and figure out uh, what people have been, you know, well, one level, uh, what their knowledge of the kind of ethnobotany of the forest is. And not being a a botanist, I need to work with a botanist to kind of detail this. But as I mentioned in the last session, you know, in an hour, this one group of men here on the right, uh, on the slide, they came up with 120 um, names for different trees and uses. So fleshing out people's uses of the forest um, and then going through and doing some social mapping, which due to a lot of the social tensions I mentioned is not an easy task. Um, But it did create a map, which I can show you um, here, which each of these flags that you see represent different um, different points in in their, you know, either an ancestral name, such as we talked about elsewhere, particular land. Um, and what we did was I created this map, and then actually Henry Ikea, who is here, who is working with me, and this is a map for me as it will well for them. Um, he came... Uh, just in May of this year, and we actually produced a very large poster-sized map and went through it and and basically created initially two copies because it's very expensive to produce, um, but we'll create more when it comes back actually in October for a month and work to document more things. And then the next level will be to go back with communities and go over these maps and help them use them uh, to negotiate better um, rights with these companies and argue for tenure cases. Um, So that sort of thing. So there are ways that one can do various things. The other thing that we did was this part of promoting cultural heritage 
is we took um, photographs taken in the 1920s to by an anthropologist, Australian anthropologist, F.E. Williams, and we translated all the captions into EI or Parari, the local language, and we made an initial run of eight copies to send back to the community to get their feedback um, to then kind of promote um, more work with cultural heritage because part of the problem is that people don't know their oral histories and the youth that are kind of growing up today, um, for better or worse, they're more inclined to um, listen to hip hop that is being produced locally uh, than, you know, traditional songs that are sung on guitar, which are about the relationships people have with the forest or with bird species. So one hopes that if we can actually do such things as create a cultural center um, to bring these photographs back, to help document in a kind of community participatory and collaborative way, some we can empower the community such that they may um, think differently about deforestation and think more um, about different alternatives, right? Um, and there's some other complicating factors uh, in terms of Papua New Guinea stuff, but yeah, I'll leave it that there. Josh, it's, it's amazing how you um, become... Um, you know, as a visitor, you become part of the community. Uh, you listen to and and uh, grow a relationship that helps people share stories with you. And then, in a way, you become part of the local history by sharing <clears throat> back what you've captured in the form of images and stories and helping plot them and save them. Uh, do you kind of feel like you're part of the story of these regions where you've been working and studying and living? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm part of them as much as one can be as an outsider. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I was very privileged to be given a local name. Um, uh, someone ended up naming a child after me. And, I, I, you know, I'm someone who takes that pretty seriously. So, you know, my son actually is one of his middle names is after my uh, close um friend and colleague. Um, and I would actually call him a father who passed away this year. Uh, last year, actually, um, my son has his name. Um, so it's one of these kind of lifelong kind of commitments that you have, and that means helping with school fees, um, hosting people like Henry. Um, one hopes with the Smithsonian we're going to be doing a Folklife Festival in 2013, and it looks like Mapayo, um, about 14 members of Mapayo's community, will be able to come here. So, you know, it's a process, a lifelong process. I wouldn't be in the job I have now if it weren't for the men and women that I've worked with sharing the knowledge that they did with me. Um, I wouldn't be speaking to you on the phone about this if um, they weren't able to, they didn't trust me, right? So it's about kind of lifelong engagement as far as I can see, and it's a very humbling thing because I wouldn't, you know, as I said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. So part of it is about figuring out how to give back. And then in one way, I can never give back fully. And then there are the complicating politics as we've been talking about of the logging, right? I can't go in and tell people not to do what they're doing. What I can do as an anthropologist is to kind of help educate communities and empower people like Henry and others to kind of think about other uh, possibilities. Um, I do see a comment from Andrew about hip hop produce. Um, it does perpetuate uh, cultural knowledge. I would, you know, that is a good corrective. I would add, though, in the case of where I'm working, um, I have yet to see that. So mostly it's about Port Moresby and things. So there is certain knowledge that's perpetuated, but um, there's also stuff that's being lost. But that is a very good point. I mean, I don't want to give anyone the impression that uh, the communities I work with are not dynamic and changing. Um, but it does raise an issue, I think, this work with how we're all globally interconnected and the importance of oral histories, the importance of thinking about what one's actions do um, and that sort of thing. Well, I, I have a better understanding among many things as a result of the time we spent <laughs> with you today as to what it means to, to curate globalization. Uh, in, right. And that, that final point you're making uh, really goes to that quite nicely. And um, we will, as part of your oral history uh, that you've shared about some of your, your travels and what you've learned, we have documented that in the form of today's recording and also in the form of this great illustration that Dan is putting together, which, um, although fun and lighthearted, uh, captures the, I think, the, the, the relationships and the, the mm. kind of issues that you're helping people think about from right. an anthropological perspective. So we will give that back out in, and uh, see uh, how that drawing and how today's session uh, becomes yeah. part of the histories. 
And I would just add, I mean, this is, of course, we did this to give people an example of, of the sort of relationships that emerge from art, uh, from history. And I don't know, Adam, if we can jump to the last slide, but I mean, really the, the kind of thing and the challenge for everyone is that, you know, in engaging in oral history, it's really, we're thinking about future generations, right? So it's thinking about the youth, such as these young kids um, from a coma village in the Prairie Delta. And this is where the more that we can have, and globally, children and the various teachers out there that are hopefully listening and engaging, think about the various issues of global interconnection far, and oral histories and what the role of forests, and then engaging and documenting that, you know, I think the world will be hopefully a better place, or at least a more knowledgeable one. Well, yeah. I, I th thanks to your good work and sharing what you do so well, um, I think I think we're on the right track, and I hope people will uh, visit the shoutlearning.org website where and revisit the last session we just did about how you can tell stories. They're all important. Um, the stories we're focusing on here at Shout this year are related to um, the around the forests and the land, and this is uh, 2011 is the International Year of the Forest, so it's a good year to focus on right. stories. Uh, that relate to the land. So thank you so much, Joshua. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. We look forward to hearing about more of your work and more of the stories that you'll be sharing. And I do hope people will uh, visit shoutlearning.org, keep the discussions going. We've got our teacher community. We've also got the global classroom and a great tour of the global classroom available. So do check that out. And remember that you can follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, both places we're known as Shout Learning. So check us out. And uh, again, uh, Please take part in the Citizen uh, Storytelling Project, and you can check out the recording of all of today's events uh, by tomorrow on the Shout Learning website. Thanks again. I've put a quick evaluation up on the top left. We would love your feedback so we can keep making events that are useful to all of you. And uh, we'll see you online. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It was great.